thanks guys for being here today. And thank you, Delali, for letting us shake up the format a little. Um, I wanted to make sure that we could showcase the work that we've been doing uh, across government and also help to introduce other ways that you guys can get involved other than just working for the US Digital Service. Um, so as Delali said, I am the, in a very government-y title, Executive Director of the Digital Service at the Department of Health and Human Services. My team is chartered between the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, as David highlighted our work on Medicare payments, um, as well as being able to work on other issues that come up across health and human services. Prior to joining US Digital Service, I actually had started my career in government, worked as something called a contracting officer, which is the person that awards contracts. Uh, so I managed a lot of really large, fucked up IT systems um, and overpaid for most of them. So I exited that space and really wanted to move into an opportunity to bring great technology to the table. So I worked for startups and a number of companies, uh, really making sure that companies like the ones you guys work for could come and do business with the government. And that system is still broken, right? So I'm back here trying to make sure that healthcare and the way we are building and buying technology in government is, is changing. Um, so right now, our team has been working on something called the Quality Payment Program, which, as David alluded to, is an opportunity for Medicare to move away from fee-for-service payments for healthcare. So every time you get an x-ray, a doctor is able to charge for that specific test, right? Whereas if it's outcomes driven, their ability to just continue offering the same service over and over again without being focused on actually making you better changes. So um, we've been doing that in conjunction with one of our partners, which is the Nava Public Benefit Corporation and Ivana's here today. And David Coe has been serving as our CTO of that program. So I'm gonna let them take an opportunity to introduce themselves and then we'll start with some questions. Uh, yes, you can all hear me. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ivana, and uh, I'm a product manager at Nava Public Benefit Corporation. Um, so we partner with government agencies to radically improve government services. Um, and in addition to working with Shannon's team at uh, CMS, HHS, uh, we also work with the Department of Veteran Affairs and other state and federal agencies. Um, and currently, I'm a product manager working on the QPP um, architecture. Hey, and I got a chance to introduce myself just a second ago, but uh, my name is David Coe, and I'm uh, an engineer at the US Digital Service. I'm currently serving as the uh, CTO of the quality payment program that uh, Shannon just introduced to you all. And um, I also uh, joined the US Digital Service from a little company called OK Cupid, where I was the director of engineering. So, uh, if any of you are familiar with that, <laughs> nobody's outing themselves. Um, awesome. So, talking a little, diving a little bit more into the quality payment program and what that meant for Medicare. So, uh, basically, Congress passed a piece of legislation called MACRA, which tasked CMS for implementing this concept called value based care. Um, when Congress did that, it was pretty loosely defined. The actual implementation falls on CMS to figure out how to do that. Often what happens is that an agency uh, equipped with people who don't have experience building modern systems or thinking about user experience start to just pull together pieces of the policy and basically create a pretty shitty user experience that all of us have experienced um, in our time interacting with government, right? So MACRA actually, MACRA and the Quality Payment Program gave CMS the ability to um, basically take a few disjointed, complicated systems that made for providers needing to enter uh, information into a number of disparate places and combine them into one. And so Havana's gonna chat a little bit about what it took to kind of get us there um, and what that experience was like. So uh, as Shannon mentioned, um, the quality payment program, QPP, um, isn't, I mean, it's not the first time that CMS has tried to do value-based care. It's really hard, um, as you can imagine. There's a lot of uh, data that um, CMS needs to collect from, from doctors to be able to measure um, how they're actually doing and to be able to measure patient outcomes. And so uh, we were tasked with figuring out, like, how do we get that data from doctors 
without adding additional burden to doctors already who, who spend a lot of their time um, already filing paperwork, but also you know, their main job is to take care of patients. Um, and so what we did is um, we're approaching it from an API first um, approach. And so we're building uh, the submissions API uh, to enable both the internal systems that uh, allow doctors to submit this data to QPP, um, but also um, enable third parties who, who build the software that doctors are already using to track their, uh, to track their patient care. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to David so you can talk more about that. Uh, yeah, so an API uh, first approach, which probably doesn't sound particularly revolutionary to anybody in this room, um, is actually incredibly important and revolutionary for the government because uh, basically you have the system whereby uh, lots of people have to submit information to uh, to the government, and they it's complicated. Like if you've ever filled out a government form, you have a sense of how frustrating this was, except times a bunch. Um, and so, you know, and then a lot of other people end up paying other people to actually submit information to the to the government for them. Um, so there's all these companies whose business models just exist around giving uh, giving this data to the government, figuring out how to fill this form out. And um, we thought, well, they would be able to get it to us a lot easier and a lot faster if they could, rather than having to go through what was uh, maybe an unimaginably uh, manual process for myself and many others in this room, I would bet, uh, we were like, we could build you an API. And you could submit that data directly to our API. Um, and we could then make that data back available to you via that same API to make sure you submitted the right thing. Or that um, you could show what you submitted to your customers. So um, having this API, Previously, once you submitted something, it was a, a bit of a black box. Again, if you've interacted with the government, you probably know what I mean. Uh, we're trying to break open that black box and, and give people some visibility into what they're doing and also give people an efficient way to actually do what it is that they need to do, um, the government is asking them to do. So uh, this API first approach is actually, even though it's something very simple that we're all very familiar with, uh, is something that is actually really important and really revolutionizes the way people interact with the government. Yeah, it's always a little bit funny to talk about um, some of the quote unquote tough tech problems that we solve in government in part because to an audience like this, it feels so simple, right? Like that's the obvious answer. Um, but getting to that point took a ton of persuading and a lot of, uh, when you mentioned the word API, people would say, no, 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 no. And then you would realize that actually they didn't even know what that meant. Um, so there was a lot of conversation around what, to, <laughs> what is an API that had to happen, um, which was exciting to get to this place to help them understand their impact on the market um, and the way that we could start to improve that, that process for physicians. So one of the other interesting things that's happened in uh, my team's time working on the quality payment program is that I'm not sure how many of you have actually had interactions as a contractor trying to do work with the government. But as I alluded to, it's unbelievably difficult, not only the process of actually getting awarded work and selling your services to the government, but actually implementing the work and having to deal with the federal process or the way that we write requirements and tell engineers and people to do things is unbelievably difficult. And a super smart technical person in the room will struggle to be able to say, you're doing it wrong, because that's the person that's writing their check. Um, so we took a really different approach with the quality payment program. And we really started to rethink the way that we could run true agile development in government. Not this, like, all the requirements are up front, and you're sprinting, and somehow that's agile. Like, we wanted to actually do this and teach people uh, teach federal employees, people that were working at CMS, how to do this again. Um, and so Yvonne is going to chat a little bit about what it was like to be a contractor coming into that experience and also what it meant to define a product vision for the first time and teach people at CMS how to do that and what that meant. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, you're definitely preaching to the choir. <laughs> coming in as a contractor, uh, was definitely new for me, having come from the private sector. Uh, before this, I was at ZocDoc in New York, and before that, an e-commerce startup. So this was totally new. I came in, and there were a ton of stakeholders 
And it wasn't ever clear, still isn't clear sometimes, who's who and like what role they play. Um, but before I, before I, you know, take, let's take a step back and talk about product vision. Um, you know, it's, product vision is really important to a product team because it's sort of your sort of north star um, and that's, that's your like guiding principle and your goal for, uh, so that uh, it, it serves as an anchoring point when you're making decisions about what goes into your product roadmap and uh, making tough prioritization issues. So it's especially important when there are a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen, a lot of different stakeholders, both on the government side and the contractor side. Um, and so add on top of that, that we're, we're implementing legislation. Uh, so we're implementing MACRA. QPP is, they publish 2,000 pages of policy every single year for the program. So that's, you know, that's part of, uh, that's, that's another stakeholder in itself. And so these are all these different pieces um, and it can be a real challenge. So it's really important to have that product vision. Um, and so as a contractor, we work alongside our government partners as well as other contractors who are building other parts of the QPP um, ecosystem to align on that product vision. So uh, it has its challenges, but it's really important to have a very collaborative environment where everyone feels heard and where uh, we have that, um, we're all aligning towards the same goal. So um, as Shannon had mentioned before, uh, the goal of qual the quality payment program is to really incentivize quality care um, and at the same time uh, decrease reporting burden for doctors. Um, and so how for, for my team in particular, we're building um, a, the submissions API, which is core to the system. How do we support that goal? Um, and so to get to that point, um, we partner with uh, our product owners and product strategists and um, engineers, both at CMS as well as USDS. We talk to the other contractors who, who are building the, um, the other systems that, um, that uh, allow doctors to submit data um, to understand like what, what, what is the goal, what should be the goal. So, and for the API, that was to get as many vendors uh, on the, integrating with the API as possible. Um, and that uh, took a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussions. Um, and in addition to that, uh, something that we're really passionate about, I think at USDS and NAVA is um, approaching problems from a user-centered um, perspective, so always talking to users, feeding that feedback back into our roadmap, um, showing our stakeholders, uh, both government and contractor side, just what our users are saying and what the data says, because it's hard to argue with that, you know? Yeah, and Ivana's being pretty modest. Um, there's not just a few other contracting teams, there's 13. So there's 13 different companies with different approaches to technology building in the same system. Um, it has a lot of benefits and a lot of downsides and things that have had to be managed, uh, but it's created this amazing opportunity for us to really deliver a great product. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a tremendous amount that goes into being a contractor with all these extenuating factors that could impact what you're deploying. Um, so speaking of the kind of more in-depth technology and Ivana mentioned policy, so there's program policy, but there's also the policy that governs the way that technology is built in government. Um, so I'm gonna let David chat a little bit about what it's like to navigate things like a technical reference architecture that hasn't been updated since 2003, or requirements around security. Um, yeah, so you wanna talk about those? My favorite topic, um, security uh, compliance <laughs> in the government. Um, so yeah, uh, I, th I like to kind of think that when we're solving problems um, and building systems in the government, building software is not an easy thing to do. Um, and the government basically says every time, uh, you know, outside of the government you would have one problem, uh, we're going to give you a second problem to deal with at the same time. Um, so uh, one thing that we 
we had to deal with was, um, for instance, if you think about uh, CI/CD, right? Um, that was something that we wanted to implement that we have implemented. Um, you normally would just, you know, have to go through the trouble. And like Shannon said, we have 13 different teams working on this project. So CI/CD having that be uh, effective and um, work consistently, despite the fact that there are a bunch of different teams, is not a trivial thing to start with. Um, but on top of implementing that, there are issues uh, such as there's a a thing you may probably never have heard of, if you have, I'm sorry, called an ATO, which is, stands for Authority to Operate. Basically, it's a, it's a thing that you have to have in the government if you want to run your system in production. Someone has to sign off that your system is secure, that you can run it and it won't, be, it won't get you know, compromised, which having someone sign a piece of paper helps a lot with that. Um, but in many places um, in the government, people are just used to, you know, you can talk to them and say, well, we want to do CICD, and it's all great. You kind of know that they didn't know what you just said, but then they'll say, but uh, we also want you to make sure you, because you have this ATO, update it every time you release. So you can go through this month-long uh, documentation process every time you do a release. And so then I'm like, oh, now I'm sure you didn't know what I meant when I said CICD. Um, so some part of this is that we have to just explain and and reset where the government uh, lands with, with regard to these, but in other places we do have to uh, figure out ways to meet uh, compliance, which means getting a little bit creative, running Nessus scans as part of our CICD pipeline on a, in a regular basis. Um, so there are ways to kind of come and meet in the middle there, but it, it sets an interesting set of new technical problems just to do the things that we, we kind of all want to do on a regular, on a regular basis. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about <laughs> duplicative encryption and some of the run-ins that we had with that? Oh, yeah. So sometimes it's actually worth not fighting the battle and just doing uh, what people are asking for to check off the box. Um, I have a bunch of stories like that. One of the, the good ones that uh, I work very closely with Ivana and uh, her team on was uh, that we needed to encrypt every, uh, every taxpayer identifying our number, which is basically a social security number in our... Um, it has to be encrypted everywhere. Um, and so uh, one of the places that they wanted to, to be encrypted was, well, it needs to be encrypted in the database. And we're like, okay, well, our database is encrypted at rest, so we're okay, right? And we're like, well, no, uh, we want to make sure that you encrypt the, the, the TIN itself. So we're like, well, okay. Um, we kind of talked about a little, like, this doesn't make that much sense, and it's going to make our lives a little bit harder because we're going to have to do searches on this and... and but at the end of the day, right, um, you can spend two or three or four weeks trying to fight a battle, or you can just put a nice little uh, uh, encryption hash before you insert in the database, something uh, that you can still search on, um, and it makes everyone happy. So sometimes, sometimes that's the, the battles that you don't fight that um, end, up, uh, end up being important. But uh, yeah, we have a lot more stories like that if you want to come find me afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, there's, it's always interesting to have to do a little bit of trade-off analysis to figure out what you want to push really hard on and what you don't. And a lot of it has to do with effort, right? If it's going to take the team a ton of time to do something, we'll technically, you know, we'll try to push back more, but some stuff is just not quite worth it. Um, so speaking of continuing to kind of move stuff forward, the, the quality payment program, our first submission window is ending. Um, this month. And so I'm going to let Ivana talk a little bit about what the future roadmap looks like and some of the other problems that they'll be tackling in the next coming years. So uh, going back to that product vision, uh, we want to get more vendors using the API. So uh, we're approaching that from sort of a few angles. The first is what's the market size and how can we increase that? Um, so we're looking at different re revamping our authentication process so that um, more vendors like electronic health record software and other health IT vendors can use our API. Um, and then the second thing is like, once they get in the door, what, what barriers do they have to integrating with our API? Um, and you know, a few examples based on user research, uh, not having a real, a true integration environment is, is a real pain point. Uh, so that's something that we're going to be focusing on uh, next quarter. 
Um, and then finally, in terms of like sort of longer term, we're continuing to work with our uh, government partners and contractors um, to better understand how our team can support those overarching goals of QPP, which is ultimately to um, deliver more real-time feedback to doctors and faster so that they can uh, continue to improve the care that they deliver without being burdened by too much reporting and administrative stuff. Yeah, so obviously we're up here telling you fun stories about the work that we do and how amusing it sometimes is and hard it sometimes is. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure to leave everybody in this room with is an understanding of why we've chosen to do this work. Uh, so I know for me personally, as I highlighted, I had the opportunity early in my career to really understand what government dysfunction looked like um, and really kind of caught this bug of wanting to make it better. Like, this is my government. This is our government. We all have the choice to get involved through a multitude of, of pathways. And um, my passion for healthcare, I think, has really been driving my time at CMS. Um, staying in this role has made me recognize that CMS is the largest payer. They pay for the most amount of health care in this entire country. And the things that CMS does sets the standard for the rest of the industry, which is a little scary at times um, when we talk about the fact that these are the technical issues we're running into when other payers say that they're waiting to build a new system until CMS does. Um, and so there's this drive to show up every day to make sure not only that government can function better, but that healthcare itself can start to really move to a place where I think all of us want healthcare in this country to be. Um, and so obviously, uh, I don't think that government is anybody's really first choice when you've got a technical background or are interested in building cool things. I know for me, those are the reasons that I'm here, but I wanted to make sure that Ivana and David, who both came from private industry companies, can chat a little bit too about their drive to be here and show up every day. Yeah, I want to echo what Shannon, what you've shared with us about the major impact that CMS and some of these agencies have on our everyday lives. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, I think, combined treat uh, benefit over 100 million beneficiaries. Um, other projects that we work on at NAVA, we work with the, de the Department of Veteran Affairs to uh, modernize the appeals process. When a veteran files an appeal for, for benefits, they wait on average five years. Some folks like don't, don't survive those five years while they're waiting for that. Um, and so those are problems that, you know, when you read about them, it's heartbreaking. But then take it back to a personal level, and I've, I mean, I've, every one of us have experienced government services, and how many of us have low expectations? Uh, you know, when you go to USPS and the line takes an hour, uh, and there's only one window open, or you go, or me personally, I, when, I, when my startup shut down, I had to file for unemployment, or uh, you know, two years ago, I was unemployed for a little bit, and I had to sign up for Medicaid. And I kept getting PDFs from the New York State Health Exchange telling me that because I made zero dollars, it was over the limit of 60000 so I didn't qualify. Like, how do, and I couldn't, it took forever to figure out how to get someone on the phone to, anyways, so... <laughs> A lot of personal experiences, but think about the communities you move through too, right? Um, you know, I'm probably going to have to help my parents who are retiring soon to sign up for Medicare. Um, you know, we have tons of people. I have a brother-in-law who, who's a veteran, and he may have to tap into these benefits. Um, so I think we're all privileged in a lot of different ways, but think about the communities who, for whom, like, the most vulnerable parts of our, of our nation that these little problems that we have where a website has business hours or the line at USPS is like an hour, some people can't afford that. So that's why I come in every day. Uh, yeah, definitely seconding everything that uh, Ivana said and, and Shannon said. Um, I think from my perspective, the one thing I would want to add is um, I definitely knew you know, that I wanted to make a difference in the world, make a positive difference. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, volunteering for various organizations. Um, but I knew also that I had a particular skill, like one thing that I was good at, and that was building software. 
Um, and so, you know, how, how are you going to use that to make the world a better place? There are a lot of ways, for sure. Um, but hearing about, you know, USDS, when I learned about it for the first time and heard about these systems that, you know, if what you can do is keep a server up and running um, or build an infrastructure that allows someone to develop a big complex system, that's, there's, there's a group of people where they're like, well, we would really like to make the entire uh, American healthcare system better, but we just don't have anyone with the expertise that knows how to like build a big complicated software system. Uh, if only we had that person. Um, although people have a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of different opinions about uh, what government and, and what it does. I think there are a lot of people who just want to help and there's not a lot of expertise. So government runs a ton of software systems um, and it does a generally a pretty poor job of keeping them online, of, of making them usable, um, and of, of building them in a way that uh, allows the government people to make the best use of them. So, um, and that's mostly just because the people with the expertise to do that aren't aren't around to help uh, to help accomplish that. The people who do build these systems are very hardworking, great people to work with, um, but uh, there's there's definitely a need for expertise. So um, that was one thing that drew me very much to this job. I think just echoing what David said, I know we spent some time today making fun of the way that government works, but there's a ton of hardworking civil servants who show up every single day to keep it running, and they spend 20 plus years of their career in the same roles, and being able to bring new expertise in has been transformative. I've watched employees at CMS who now all they talk about is human-centered design, and they want to apply it to policy making, to regulation, and that is really the, that is the offering that we bring, right? Scrub in with us for a project and leave and they will continue to do great work. So um, in that van, if anybody is interested in applying, as David plugged earlier, we have a table in the corner, usds.gov slash join, please consider submitting an application. There's a number of other programs and uh, in that same note, companies like Nava are what end up driving a lot of the work forward. So if any of you have not done business with the government before, I would highly encourage you to try it. I know it's arduous and painful. There's a lot of people trying to make that better, um, but you should definitely consider it because it's great engineers and technical talent that come in as contractors that actually are the ones who end up implementing the work. So thank you guys all so much for listening to us today. I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you guys being here. Thanks. Do you, do you guys have some questions for us? We have a couple minutes. Clearly, I explained how government works in its entirety. <laughs> oh, there's a few back there. Do, can we take him a mic, Delali? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. What's the worst acronym? <laughs> I'm going to give this one to, the, to these two. Maybe David, go first. <laughs> um. Well, there was, I don't know if this is the worst acronym, but um, we, we definitely, sometimes if you want to make a project happen in the government, um, you actually have to name it with an acronym, otherwise no one will take it seriously. So um, this, was, this was not a CMS, but we did have to name a project FLASH, which I, I believe was a, a procurement vehicle at DHS, and it stood for Flexible Agile uh, Support for the Homeland. I may have missed something in there, but. <laughs> was Lean the L? Yeah, I think Lean was the L. Uh, I, my example is pretty close to QPP, but we have a system called the Web Interface, which is the most generic name ever, and it's CMS, WI. Um, and I'll also add that we, I think actually multiple contractors probably have this, but we have like GitHub repos where we can like, or spreadsheets where, and plugins where you can double click on on acronyms and it'll show you what it is because we have so many that we need to keep track of. <laughs> so can you give an example of who you say would be a great provider in industry for healthcare that you work with as part of CMS? Some story about I'm, it. <laughs> can you repeat the question? Could you give an example of a provider who was an excellent integrator with CMS as a shining example of best practice to make your lives easier?
Uh, oh, so one one good example um, of uh, I think you're asking about the integration with potentially our API. Uh, Athena Health, um, who's a, a both an EHR and a, a registry for, um, has done a very good job of of really making good use of our of our API. They've really taken they they were like we really want to have this um, and uh, actually the first day that we had launched it in production, all of a sudden uh, 30,000 hits came to one of the endpoints because they were, they were checking. We weren't expecting that, but um, luckily the system was fine with it. But um, So they were very quick out of the gate. Um, do you want to talk a little about that? Um, sure. I would also, um, well, I would add that they're also a really great partner for CMS too because they, they really understand the value of um, human-centered design and designing with users, not for them. Um, and so we uh, we actually have a, I have a monthly check-in with them and we often like share feedback with each other that's feeding back into the product. Um, so they've been a really great partner in that sense. I'm just gonna give the very government-y disclosure of we called out Athena Health, but we have lots of other great, amazing partners that we share very similar experiences with. Uh, so, yeah. So my question is more related to what you were saying earlier about to trying to get um, more, more, more companies and more people that are involved in kind of dev, DevOps practices involved with the work that you do. What are some of the lessons learned that you might share, like a couple, two or three key things that people should um, kind of come prepared to do or recognize as they, as they try to work with HHS or, or CMS? Um, yeah, so I would say, Kind of product market fit is a really important thing here. Um, paying attention to what it is that the government is actually asking for, and also providing consistent feedback. A lot of uh, a lot of contractors want to just write to the language that a that a federal agency put out, right? And that's how we win business. We basically word for word regurgitate the thing that they said and promise them that we can do it. Um, but I think that there's an important piece there of actually pushing back a little and making sure to differentiate yourself by saying, you're asking me to do this, but if you do that, it's going to give you a bad result. So that's one of the things that I would always recommend doing. I think the second piece is partnering with businesses who have established channels for business development, a contractor who's got a few contracts and maybe you add a skill set. Um, that's another great one. And the third one is also... Um, just continuing to be involved in the conversations that government's having. Like if people are putting out RFIs, if there's requests for comment on proposed uh, policy or regulation, like ensuring that your company is consistently involved in those communications is the best way to get face time with federal employees who are making decisions. Last one. So I know the, uh, the QPP program and the Blue Button API uh, reside today on GitHub. Can you talk about the process of getting the open source community involved in those projects? How, like, how does that work? Uh, I think that in, in many ways it's, it's very similar to, I guess, the process of getting the um, the open source community involved with any any new API uh, that you're launching. So a lot of the things that we do are very similar. We are basically just building a software system at the end of the day. Um, so you know, doing the outreach to people who might be interested, hearing their feedback, seeing what they would build on your API, and making sure that you can support that. Um, I think the other uh, the other layer to that is to make sure um, that we know what is the most important thing to open source um, for, for people who are out there because there is a lot more work involved in getting that public to uh, private to public flip, uh, switch flipped on GitHub that in the government than there normally is. Um, you know, you, a bunch of people are going to have to sign off on that and, you know, you're really, it, it doesn't make people who don't fully understand technology very comfortable to say, oh, we're giving them all of the source code to our system. Um, that sounds dangerous to a lot of people, um, especially people who are used to um, software development and who may be comfortable with the idea of security as, obscuri of, as obscurity. So um, 
That doesn't prevent us from open sourcing it. It just makes everything harder, and it does mean that we have to pick and choose our battles a little bit more. So especially if you are on the open source side and you're integrating with these, it's very important to figure out what it is that is most important to you, because uh, even though things will move a little bit slower, we would like to get you what is most important um, as soon as we can. So. Oh, well, great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. David, I'm sitting here looking at your scarf. Super jealous. I'm super jealous, so I'm putting mine back on. Uh, but no, I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully you'll stick around for some more.